Puy uh, from Europe. Together with Evelina Rock, uh, I am co-leading this uh, global community of practice on team, group and organization coaching. I'm going to try to pull open my screen here. Does it work? No, it does not work. Now it does. Um, some essentials, as usual, our next webinar is, will be the first Tuesday of April. Uh, later on the year, there will be coming up some strategic changes into the landscape of the communities of practice. We will communicate on those in due time, but for the moment, everything remains the same. Um, these are typically the topics that we are dealing. Uh, if you're interested in those, you can download this presentation right here. It's uh, the deck with the information slides that I'm showing you right now. It is interesting to download them because for the new members that are participating the first time, you can find here all needed links. The link to be part of the community, the link, the email link if you want to share feedback. Our LinkedIn uh, group, we have by the way just reached 2,000 members. Can you believe it? 2,000 members. Thank, thanks a lot for that. This is the link to the Facebook page, the link to our Twitter account. So you can have all these together if you wish. And we also have some help for you in case you missed the webinar. There are recordings on our YouTube channel and there are slides on our slide share. You can also download the slide deck of today's speaker right uh, here. Um, if you're interested, you can download them through the presentation or afterwards. Last but not least, the ones of you who the ones of you who participate through this go to webinar application, you do not need to send any passwords if you want to obtain your CCEU credential. You can simply leave it as it is. The ones who participate over bridge line or the ones who have any technical difficulties during uh, the webinar, they should send two passwords to Elizabeth Jackson at Coach Federation right here. The first password is spring. Spring, that's the first password. That makes me come to a moment where I can introduce our speaker. This is a beautiful picture of Sarah Boas. I am very grateful to Sarah because it's the second time that she's willing to speak uh, on a session. The first time it was in a much smaller community a few years ago. This is her second time. Sarah, uh, you have probably read her bio in the invite. I'm not going to read it again, but she's always been focused on combining things. Uh, uniting stakeholders' value and core human values, uh, uniting uh, lifelong personal and corporate transformation and development. So it's always the and and focus on combining things that are not so evident to combine that she's been focusing on. She's got her own firm, Boas uh, Consulting, and she's also active for the London Business School. Apart from that, she's also, re she's also received the Leadership Guru's Award of Excellence and she, com she combines many disciplines, psychology, anthropology, organizational behavior, somatics, philosophy of science, etc. Today she will bring a story on VUCA. VUCA has also been central in our previous webinar. There we focused on what managers can do with VUCA. Now we want to focus on what coaches can do with Voca. How do you bring silence? How do you bring awareness in a very, very um, shaking VUCA world at the moment? Sarah, uh, I give you the floor. Uh, lots of success. Thank you. Thank Please you so much, Carl. Sarah, do you see the button? Yes. Yes, yes, I do, and yes. I'm just slightly, there we are. Hopefully everybody can now see the first slide on my screen. I just want to check with you, Carl, if that's looking fine from your perspective. It's very fine, thank you. Perfect, so thank you so much for that warm introduction. I really appreciate it, and thank you for inviting me back to speak with all of you again. And It's wonderful that so many of us can be here together, and uh, really a special opportunity for me to share, I guess, some of my own explorations as a coach, some of my own learnings, but most of all the spirit of inquiry that I bring to my own work. And I see this hour together as an opportunity for us to share an inquiry, to share an exploration 
and as you said, Carl, to explore what VUCA means not only in the area that's been so much talked about for quite a few years now in terms of VUCA management, VUCA leadership, uh, dealing with a VUCA world, but particularly this question of looking at the inherent VUCA in our own human nature, taking a look inside, inside ourselves as coaches, and exploring how that could actually enhance our work as coaches, and particularly for this group today, coaching teams, groups, organizations in this VUCA world. So that's the, the spirit that I bring to this, and my thoughts in terms of what to share are as follows. So really what we're looking at here is, of course, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. There's been a lot of discussion of these in terms, as we said, of management and leadership in recent years. What strikes me is the extent to which volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity are really an inherent part of our own human nature. And that's the starting point that I'd like us to be taking today and really the assumption with which I'm coming to our conversation. I will be inviting us to explore the VUCA within each one of us. And as I do that, although this is, uh, from an audio perspective, very much a, a one-way dialogue, I will be inviting all of you to type in some questions and some comments at specific moments, and then Carl will be able to feed some of those back into our discussion to make this more of a, a coaching-style conversation between myself and all of you. I'd like then to move on to looking at not only the dangers of VUCA, which of course have been much discussed and much researched, but also what might be the gifts of VUCA, the gifts of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. What do they make possible and how might we harness those? And then what strategies, responses, transformations we bring to them. And the idea of this session is really taking ourselves as a metaphor by looking in, can we learn something? about VUCA in other complex systems. So we take the individual, our own self, as a complex system and see what that can teach us about a team, a group, an organization, and the wider environment in which our clients work. And then, of course, thinking about how we might apply all of this to our own practice as we move on. Excuse me there, something's... There we are. I want to just say a little bit about uh, who am I. And I thought it would be fun uh, to try to share with you a couple of reflections on my own VUCA qualities. And of course, my intention here is not uh, self-disclosure for the sake of it, but rather to resonate with each of you in encouraging you to look within yourselves and to think about how do these VUCA qualities show up in you? What does your own VUCA look like? Um, so Carl has given a very kind introduction to who I am as a professional, and of course you can read more about that. Uh, but as a human being, which is really the, the center of what we're talking about here today, uh, well, you know, I'm pretty calm and stable by nature, but of course I also have my own volatility. And earlier today I was thinking, what form does volatility take in me? And I thought of a couple of things. One is, I think when I encounter something that crosses my values, something that seems to me to be unjust or unfair, I can become very upset. And as for all of us, volatility at an individual level can take the form of flight or fight. For me, it's often a kind of emotional flight. So if I'm very upset by something, then I start to think, oh, you know, I just need to leave. So it might not show itself very obviously in behavior, but that was an area in which I could really find volatility within myself. And as I said, I'm sharing this with you as a way to introduce myself, to be present with you, but especially to stimulate you to think about what is your particular form of volatility? And then what about uncertainty, being un unpredictable in certain ways? I think here what comes to my mind, if I look inward, and I'm of course encouraging you to do the same as you listen, is the way that I might feel a great enthusiasm for something, 
And then a few days later, feel a great enthusiasm for something else. I find the world endlessly rich, endlessly interesting. And so I can have a tendency to start things that are very exciting to me. And then perhaps before they're finished, want to start something else. Moving on to complexity. I think this is something that is probably quite easy for uh, all of us to identify within ourselves. My sense is that what it means at a personal level is the way in which many forces are at work within us. Uh, it's hard to say, I do this because of that. Uh, we have multiple motivations. We have multiple senses of purpose and meaning and things that are important to us. And in fact, going back to Carl's kind introduction and when he said that my work is very much about combining things and the and, and view of the world, I think this is really central. The sense of our own complexity and the challenge that we each have as coach, as coachee, as simply a member of society to bring together and integrate many different aspects of self. For me personally, that involves things like, of course, being a coach, being a leader, being a mother, being a daughter, a sister, a friend. There are so many different aspects to this, wanting to be reclusive, wanting to be gregarious, you know, finding these different qualities within myself. And once again, I encourage you also to look inward as I speak and think about what forms these take in you. And then ambiguity. And uh, again, it seems to me such an essential part of what it simply is to be a human being that we do something, sometimes knowing exactly why we're doing it, but often finding that actually it has multiple meanings. Uh, when I think about my clients in senior leadership roles, are they there because they want to make the world a better place? Are they there because they want to be loved and needed? Are they there because they uh, seek power and feelings of empowerment and authority? Uh, my sense is that all of those are true. And I think the ambiguity of human nature has a lot of uh, its expression in the way that our actions actually are quite complex in their motivation once again. And the, the meaning of what we do or even what we say is often multiple and hard to pin down. So this is really uh, at, the, at the center of what I'd like us to be exploring here today. And the way that I propose to work is that I'll share some thoughts. Uh, my intention as I'm doing that is really first and foremost not so much to be the expert as to stimulate your thoughts your reflection, and then I'll take some moments simply to invite you to type in comments and questions uh, as we go through and to ask Carl to share one or two of those. Of course, they won't all be shared as we go through. So perhaps we can take the first of those moments now. And if you were, as I was talking, able to go along with me and to think about the VUCA within yourself, what it looks like in you, because it's a little different, of course, in every human being, to be volatile, to be uncertain, to be complex, to be ambiguous, and type in a few comments, thoughts about that for Carl to share with us. I'm going to be quiet for a moment for you to do that, and then for Carl to share some feedback. Yes, friends, please shoot. Vuka, staying human. Stress level goes up when uncertain, always shows up with disruption of emotion, uncertainty for me when faced with the unfamiliar, I can be excited, volatile sense of humor, ambiguity means doubting myself, volatile hunger down, Vuka is life, no, uncertainty, difficulty <laughs> making decisions, human development is always volatile, uh -huh. My volatility comes out as anger, loss of insight, and now it becomes really a tsunami of inputs. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, confusing opportunity, complexity is overload. I love ambiguity. Complexity is distractions. It's about self-management. That's an interesting one too. Um, complexity, multiple interests. Acknowledgement uh, of us as VOCA uh, decreases the emotional impact, complexity, I love the puzzle, um, thank goodness for meditation, uh -huh. uh, uncertainty, 
uh, enthusiasm for new things again and again, fear, uh, difficulty to isolate and focus on important things, um, yes. The, the feeling that I get, Sarah, is that um, that our participants are looking to VUCA in a little bit an ambiguous way. Uh, I, I read feedbacks uh, related to, to fear, to uncertainty, uh, to disruption, but I also read a few times um, opportunity. Uh, it is life itself uh, making the best of it. So my impression is that VUCA triggers very ambiguous feelings, positives and negative ones. Beautiful. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, everybody, for your contributions. I think uh, what I, I've got a big smile on my face now because I think what I'm feeling here is a sense of community, a sense of togetherness in, indeed, this very uh, inherent ambivalence that we may feel towards our own VUCA. And uh, some of the the comments that really stood out for me was that VUCA is life, the, the doubting self on the one hand, how it can take that form, but on the other hand, that lovely phrase, I love the puzzle. And I think for us as coaches, uh, or you know, if we have a coaching role as leaders and as managers, that sense of the willingness to doubt, the willingness to be with the anxiety, to be with the, the difficulty of life, and at the same time to feel the love for the puzzle. Uh, I have a sense that this growing comfort we can have with our own willingness to do so is somehow really at the center of our potential and our skill to be really mature coaches working with depth and finesse. So let's think a little bit more about each one. And uh, I'm just going to share a few thoughts. And again, the invitation is for you all to be thinking along with me, to type in some comments, some questions, some thoughts as we go. And then I'll pause once again for Carl to have a look at that and share some summary of what seems to be coming through. When I think about volatility, uh, I think what interests me is this sense of how, on the one hand, it's so much part of our human nature. One of my areas of interest, actually, in my coaching is to, to look at the what I call the F responses. I already mentioned fight and flight. Uh, I also think it's interesting to look at uh, freezing and uh, feigning, which means pretending, like playing dead. Uh, and we can also think about flock. So the five F responses that are really reactions to fear that, of course, we see in the bigger world, sometimes in real physical violence, terrible things that go on in the world. And I think you know all of us uh, read the news and are aware of, of really how VUCA plays out in the most uh, physically destructive and dangerous ways in the wider environment. And of course, the very term VUCA comes from a, a military analysis initially. But if we take it down to its more subtle expression in each of us, uh, one of the things that we see within ourselves, that we see within our clients, and that plays such a huge role within teams, groups, and organizations is the, the volatility that comes from responses to fear, the volatility of fight, of flight, of people freezing, of people uh, feigning, like just going very droopy, opting out, zapping, that's what the feign response is about, or flocking, uh, which means grouping together when fear is felt, but which can take the the, the sort of form of people actually forming cliques, uh, in-groups, out-groups, sub-groups, sub-teams, these kinds of things that, of course, as we all know, can be quite dangerous to any organizational culture and to the groups, teams, organizations we work with. Uh, so when thinking about volatility and thinking about what it means to us within ourselves and how we manage this within ourselves uh, and, of course, in the world around us, it strikes me that we need, of course, to look also at what is its opposite, which is some kind of stability. And we might want to think about how we create stability, first and foremost, within ourselves in the face of these fear responses. So if we are noticing within ourselves or in our clients, fight, flight, freeze, feign, or flock responses, what can we do? And very interestingly, I think one of the things that we can do is simply being in our own calm center. Whether we're talking about our own volatility or somebody else's, the more calm energy 
that we bring to our interaction, the more that impacts on the coachee, on the system of which we are a part. And of course, some of you will be aware of research that's gone on into things like hormonal, nonverbal communication that takes place where our own inner state is impacting directly the inner state of those around us and thus, of course, the kinds of dynamics, relations, interactions that are going on. Moving on to uncertainty, when I think about that within ourselves, when we're in that kind of unpredictability, the, the unpredictability of our own nature, even to ourselves. How do we manage that? I think one of the things that's come through in a lot of the VUCA literature that we can also apply to self is this sense of having a kind of a larger vision, something that we come back to, something that gives us a perspective so that even when we're shifting from one perspective to another, from one priority to another, there's something that we come back to that keeps us on track, that means that within this kind of movement and uh, unpredictable dance, there's, there's a sense to it, there's an order to it, there's a kind of progress to it. Thinking about complexity and the many forces upon us, within us, it, it strikes me that as we mature, one of the things that we need to do is simply to recognize and passionately embrace our own complexity. And that the more we're able to do that, the more we're able to acknowledge and recognize and make friends with the many aspects of self, the many forces at play within each of us as human beings, the more we can really expand our area of comfort in our coaching, as as well, of course, in other areas of our life. And this embracing of complexity, this enlarging of our own sense of identity of who we are and how we are may be a really important key here. And then the ambiguity. It's so nice sometimes to try to counter ambiguity with certainty, with taking a very specific and sometimes quite narrow position, even a feeling of righteousness, uh, knowing what is good and right, knowing how things should be. Uh, that's also part of our human nature, of course, to try to do so. But I wonder whether one of the appropriate responses and the important responses to our own ambiguity is actually to be willing to be in this place of not knowing, to be in the place of mixed meanings, of haziness, of something having multiple interpretations and all those interpretations being in some sense true. So these are a few thoughts. I'd like to now invite you once again, if you haven't already done so, to type in your own thoughts, your own comments, and to invite Carl to share a few examples or samples of those, Carl, or indeed whatever theme seems to be coming through to you, Carl, in response. I'll be just quiet for a, a few moments here. Yes, here I am. Please go ahead, Carl. Um, if the opposite of volatility is stability, how does um, a coach, how does a coach help the client not to? And then there's a technical problem with my screen. I can't read the entire. Yes, here. Um, if the opposite of volatility is stability, how does a coach help the client not to confuse stability with maintaining status quo? That's one. Mm. Um, I'm thinking of a particular client who, well, uh, and how tortured he is by denying, avoiding these things in himself. And my parallel process as a coach, that's a, that's a really uh, intense one. Um, appreciate your self-reflection and it resonates with me. Uh -huh. uh, I'm reminded so clearly that as a coach, we are the instrument of change. If we are not calm, how can we help others in that space? So. There's a pattern in we as a coach should at all at all price I think remain calm and at ease and in peace with ourselves if we want to able to help our clients uh, coming in peace and there's a lot more coming um, yes 
Facebook. He asking to ourselves, he has again that parallel between the coach and the coachee. Um, surrender to what is, comes to mind of VOCA, uh, living fully in each moment, yes. Um, yes, again, the mirror, right? the mirror between the coach and the coachee in the VOCA context. Um, yes, that's about the same. Then about energy, I think there's a lot of potential to shift the energy after a client sits with and describes what they are feeling in that space. Yes, what is VUCA doing to the energy? Uh, yes, the great one. Uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that summarizes uh, a lot. Um, tolerance for ambiguity. Um, oh, that's a nice one too. Using curiosity as a strategy for dealing with any of the four states seems to be helpful. Curiosity as a strategy. Um, yeah, how does it deal with, okay. I think, uh, I think that uh, I, I see two patterns. Uh, first pattern is um, we, uh, the, 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 the being present, the presence that as a coach we always have to put central if we want to be at our ease with our clients. In a VUCA context, I think that being present is even more, more, um, um, is, even, is even more challenging. So how can, how can we guarantee the, the peaceful relationship between coach and coachee when the coachee is in VUCA mood and, and what does it do with the coach? And uh, secondly, how can we bring him to to embrace exactly uh, that, uh, that that Vuka, that Vuka animal? Uh, th those are the two patterns I'm seeing. Thank you very much, Carl. Yes, and thank you all for sharing your wisdom and uh, some really uh, wonderful comments there. And thank you for sharing and summarizing them, Carl. I think this indeed this being comfortable with being uncomfortable is very much at the center here and you know we each have our own ways of approaching that but for many of us it might be that as we go through life not only within our work but throughout every aspect of our life that we become more familiar with the discomforts with the challenges with the particular forms that for example VUCA as we're talking about today takes in us and we become more able to be a witness to ourselves first which of course then allows us to be uh, a calm centered and constant witness to our coaches our clients um, at the same time, we're talking about acknowledging and managing the dangers of VUCA, and I think it's really important to do this. People have talked earlier about self-doubt, about anger, about you know, some, some of the forms that VUCA takes in us that can be potentially destructive. Uh, and my own feeling is it's, it's really important to recognize uh, how we ourselves can be destructive if we simply indulge our own VUCA qualities. But as that lovely comment about the energy shifting uh, makes so clear, we can also think about how do we recognize and how do we harness the gifts of volatility, the gifts of uncertainty, of complexity, of ambiguity. And maybe part of what we're looking at here is finding a kind of balance between, on the one hand, being able to manage those VUCA qualities in ourselves, being role models, whether it's explicit or impl implicit, for our clients managing their own VUCA qualities. And I should perhaps make explicit that I believe that we are always, as coaches or as leaders with coaching, uh, a coaching role, we are always role models for our clients, uh, like it or not. And so what we do will always be in some way reflected, reproduced, even magnified within the clients. At the same time as doing that, how can we also sometimes actually take this, uh, I like when, when you said the VUCA animal, Carl, you know, take this sort of wild animal and harness it in a sense, in a way that doesn't kill its energy, but that actually puts it to very good use. And so we're looking at something quite quite complex and subtle here. We're looking at, on the one hand, being able to find a still calm place within ourselves, a place of certainty, a place of simplicity, a place of exactness, a place where we really know 
what's important, what it's all about, what our core values are, uh, and we feel calm and stable. And at the same time, going back to that first comment that you shared, Carl, from one of our participants today, that we're not just then maintaining or colluding with the client and maintaining the status quo. So we've got something very exciting here, uh, that something that at the, at the same time we need to manage and really let live, let it do its work uh, with the acknowledgement that that work is sometimes going to be quite uncomfortable. I think one of the really interesting ways that we can think about this is this idea that rather as in a, the image of yin and yang, everything containing the seed of its opposite, that perhaps each VUCA quality itself contains the seed of its opposite. Perhaps by allowing things to be volatile, to be uncertain, to be complex, to be ambiguous, and really being at ease with that, as one of the participants wrote, that actually through this and within this, when we're really comfortable with it, when we're really able to be witness to it and confident with it, that through that we find positive change happening and we find new forms starting to emerge. And so I'd like once again now to pause to invite feedback on this and really very specifically what kinds of strategies, what kinds of responses, what kind of transformations of a VUCA quality into its opposite in some new form we might see and to invite you to share some thoughts about how we do that. We've talked about something very important already and several of you wrote about it, this parallel process. My personal belief is that that's probably the most important intervention is what we actually do within ourselves. Perhaps you'd like to share more about that. Perhaps you'd like to share more about how this starts to play out in team coaching, group coaching, organizational coaching. How does the way that we manage these within ourselves play out in our work? So once again, I'll be quiet for a moment, invite a few more comments, and invite you, Carl, to read them and share the essence of them. Yes, please. Uh -huh. A place of certainty within ourselves, uh, I need a movement for that. Uh, the positive side of volatility is the openness to change and innovation. <laughs> it's not an either or, it's both and, and more that as something new emerges. Um, clearly being in the moment and observing ourselves in the VUCA quality might bring up a way to live with it. Um, look what's underneath it, then underneath, etc., etc. Using a systemic approach can help provide perspectives. Um, by naming our fear, we can begin to imagine what we need to deal with. Uh, just being aware that our coaches look at us, awareness is key. Find common seats within each seemingly diverse and complex options. Focusing on relationship people who have around VUCA, their way of being. Mindfulness, what I experience is signal, an indication of where I am at. Energy is contagious, if we shift to what that serves, etc. The ambiguity has a character of freedom, yes. Watching my grand, <laughs> watching my granddaughter have temper tantrums at age two, uh, learn deep breathings. I see two aspects: self-awareness and mindfulness. Awareness to accept and embrace. Secondly, continuously learning, uh, learning to resistance, embrace focus energy. Uh, the the pattern that I'm that I'm seeing here, Sarah, is that by uh, by using words, by naming things, by naming different aspects of this VUCA and what it does with us, um, that, that brings tranquility for the coachee and um, for the coach. Uh, that, that's what I'm seeing here. I, I see um, in various terminology coming back the need for, for giving things a name. Um, using words 
for things that are present uh, in the relationship between coachee and coach related to, uh, to, to VUCA. Uh, probably because VUCA is a way too big uh, the ramming, an animal to, to, to embrace it uh, in, in, in one big piece. That's what I'm reading. Thank you very much, Carl. Yes, I think it's really interesting uh, what a common theme there is in these various comments. And it makes me think of practices from various wisdom traditions, such as the idea of naming the demons, you know, from Vipassana meditation, uh, mindfulness meditation, where rather than trying to control what's going on within us, we observe it, we witness it, we become witnesses to our own inner processes, and we name the, the feelings, the experiences, the emotions, the impulses that come up, and they don't go away but their role changes and their power over us changes uh, and there's sometimes I think that image of getting onto a horse either the horse is just bolting and wild or we are actually the rider on the horse and we have choice about is where we're going to go. There is there's one more interesting perspective I'm, I would like to add. I see yeah. four or five uh, references to the concept uh, as known as deep, very deep listening. Uh, I, I read the suggestion that the VUCA context challenges as coaches even more to an even deeper listening to what is said and what is not said by the coachee. And I also see even one reference to the deep listening aspect of Otto Chalmers theory U. Um, uh, but I think that uh, I, I think that the group uh, also some of them seems to think that deep listening is particularly important in a VUCA context. Yes, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I think it also comes through in this sense of uh, somebody used the term look underneath, uh, looking deeper, listening, the deep listening of course to other and also to self. And the word freedom came through and I think this is really interesting because I think in this deep listening and being present in our deep listening, that we enlarge the space within which we can move, within which we can live, and in doing so we create a kind of space for the client, and for the complexity of, of the client system and the client set of relationships to be in greater freedom. Uh, I love the fact that the, there was so much emphasis on awareness coming back from you all because our own awareness is of course really the key to our own ease. Not ease in the sense of something being easy, but ease in the sense of that comment that came up earlier, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, that, that we are used to how life is, that we have a, an acceptance of its in inherent VUCA and that by raising this awareness and being in a sense uh, friends, good friends to ourselves, uh, that this creates a space of freedom and of possibility where VUCA isn't something just as a kind of problem to be managed, which of course I'm sure many of you have seen in the management literature around VUCA, it's treated as something a problem that should be made to, to go away, something that should be simply dealt with. Uh, but but also as an immense space of opportunity and that the more comfortable we can become with it, the more we can bring awareness to it, mindfulness to it, the more we can start to tap its potential and its opportunity rather than be ruled by it. What we're doing here and what I'm um, inviting each one of you to do at an individual level is to look at yourself really as a metaphor for your client systems. So some of you work uh, perhaps primarily with individuals that are interested in team and group coaching. Some of you may work with teams, with groups, with organizations, or indeed with very, very large, multifaceted, multinational complex systems. And I'd like to ask each of you to take a moment to really look inward and to think to ask yourself the question, how am I in my own VUCA and in my relationship to my VUCA like my clients? How can I learn about my clients simply by looking inward, 
what new discovery do I find right here now today when I look deeply within myself? So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and invite you to, to look within, to practice that self-awareness, that inner naming, that inward looking, and, that, and, and deep listening to self in this moment, and to share some comments and thoughts and questions that Carl can then read out and summarize for us all. So I'll once again be quiet for a few moments here. Yes, please. Uncertainty and uh, self-doubt. Yeah. Um, when I'm asking myself, is as a coach, I have deep listening to the coachee. Do I have? Do I have the same deep listening to myself? That's a great one. Um, or am I being such that I am experiencing this? There's a deep resistance to surrender to VUCA, having the courage to explore my reactions to my clients. Yes, that's great. I have some of the same fears and challenges as my clients have. That's great. Yeah. Um, I'm like my clients in that I might be influenced by VUCA without being aware of it. Yeah. Dealing with the unknowing of the future, compassion for our common challenges. Um, yes. So much change going on for self in the world in general. Being less judgmental to myself, I will help to be more empathetic with my clients. Um, that's an interesting one. It's in general the judgments we have towards our coaches that, uh, that, that bias us. Um, yes, it's a journey with company and support on the patch. Um, we are all at the simplest level human. And yes, yeah, so we are as coach have certainly our, our limitations as well. Um, what, what level of my vulnerable, vulnerability is helpful to my client? Nice. Um, yes, control my judgment reaction. Um, yes, I'm not surprised by VUCA because I love the puzzle, uncertainty. Um, VUCA have a lot of noise. Yes, the pattern that I'm seeing, Sarah, um, is that um, all, all possible kind of human imperfections <laughs> that we have as coaches ourselves, um, all possible kind of mental and emotional limitations that we have as coaches ourselves in this VOCA context, how that can impact the coachee negatively and positively. So it's a very strange perspective. In general, it's the limitations, the, the biases that we have towards our coaches, our, our coaches, that limits the process of our of our of, of our own uh, of our own uh, initiatives towards coaching. Now I read the focus on what about our own limitations? What about our own vulnerability? How can that impact the coaching? Thank you, Carl, and thank you all for those really really interesting comments and insights. I think what we're looking at here is really of some importance and this focus on compassion to self, listening to self, courage to look inward, uh, questions about judgments towards self. Is one theme coming through here, as you said, Carl, that uh, really can, can shape the quality of our coaching practice. It's easy perhaps to be a pretty good coach without having empathy for self, uh, without really listening to oneself. And I, I happen to think that there are very many pretty good coaches out there who tend actually to practice a, a level of self-neglect and to be very, very focused on the other and on being helpful and so on. But I wonder whether we can really be great coaches if we do that. And I think what's coming through from some of these comments and thoughts is the importance of actually starting with self, looking within, listening within, having courage. There was one comment uh, that came through. I'm not sure if it was intended this way, but I'll, I'll respond to it anyway because it may be of relevance. That was something about, I'm not surprised by Fuga because I love the puzzle, um, which is one that I a phrase that came earlier and that I responded to. It does strike me, however, that it's quite important for those of us who might be very comfortable with volatility, uncertainty, complex and ambiguity, very comfortable with those things, to 
to look inward and make sure that we're not being blasé and to to find the opportunity to find our own edge and to find that discomfort that actually does require courage within ourselves as a way to connect with our clients' areas of fear or challenge. Uh, there was a comment about the common fears and challenges, how we share those with our clients. And being willing to go to our own edge, even if it's much further in terms of FUCA than our clients' edges, may be really important so that we can really be in compassion and empathy, not only with the VUCA qualities, but also with the ways in which these can be emotionally challenging at a conscious or, of course, much more often at an unconscious level. I think what comes through really strongly as well is this sense of common humanity and how our common humanity is such an important basis for our coaching work. And I'd just like to take us to thinking about this in terms of a particular lens, a particular model. It's one of what I call the tools for transformation that in the context of Boaz Consulting I develop and share. And the VIA tool for transformation is our coaching model. It has three parts, vocation, integration and alignment. And I thought that it would be interesting if I would very briefly summarize these in relation to the conversation that we're having today and in relation to our own inherent VUCA and being team and group coaches in a VUCA world. So there is, by the way, an article on the website that uh, introduces VIA. And those of you who are not familiar with it can simply go there and download that and have a read. And of course, um, you know, email me if you want to be in touch and discuss it further. Because I'm only going to say a very few words now. But as I was thinking through my own relationship to my own inherent VUCA as a coach and how that can either limit or expand and deepen my coaching practice, it struck me that VIA was quite relevant here. So VIA has three parts. The first one is vocation and that's really about what we stand for. And I'd like to also link this back to something that came up in the last set of comments and the themes that Carl drew out, which is the importance of naming and putting language on VUCA. Because there's another aspect that I feel may be really important here, which is our nonverbal communication with other and with self. And the kind of dance that we're engaged in, really at a bodily, somatic level, the way we breathe, the way we sit, the way we stand, the way we feel, and how that not only expresses, but also influences the way that we are relating to ourself and, of course, to our clients in the complex and interesting ways that you've all been commenting on. Vocation, which is our own sense of meaning, purpose, our calling, which is, of course, what it literally means in Latin, is that deep core sense of this is what I'm about, this is what I stand for that literally takes us, when we allow itself to express itself physically in us, it takes us into an upright position. I stand for something. When we see people or when we ourselves are connected with our vocation, our spine becomes very upright, we become very symmetrical, we might be sitting or we might be standing, but we've all seen it in our coaches, we've all experienced it in ourselves. And it does strike me that when we're looking at VUCA and we're looking for that still center, that our own vocation, our own sense of what really matters most to, to us, what gives our life and our life work meaning and purpose, is that resource that's going to bring us back to the still center that we need in order to be able to to move with the dance of VUCA. You have 10 minutes left, Sarah, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to integration, when we look at a coaching conversation or a coaching relationship, we move from vocation into integration. And this goes back very much to what Carl referred to when he said that my life work is very much about combining things, about the and, and. Integration in terms of the VIA tool transformation is about embracing, knowing, 
and bringing into harmonious as a kind of effective inner team within ourselves or within an individual client before we even look at those larger systems of groups, teams, organizations, and the environment. Different aspects of self, different aspects of who we are, so that where they have been in conflict, as they are for many of us within ourselves and our clients, inevitably as part of life, that we bring them into a kind of harmonious cooperation without conflating them, without making the inner differences disappear. So for us in VUCA terms, this might mean I am volatile and I am stable. It might mean I am uncertain and I am also predictable. It might mean I am complex and I am also clear and simple. It might mean I am ambiguous and I am also exact. And that we integrate these different VUCA qualities and their opposites within ourselves, and that might be a really important part of our parallel process. In terms of the VIA coaching tool for transformation, we then move into alignment once we've established the vocation and the integration, and alignment is about how we work with others, how the energy of a number of individuals, whether it's a team or a much larger system, works together in an aligned energy to get things done, to make things happen that are of shared importance. And I think that it's only after we've really found our still center and integrated our different VUCA qualities and their opposites that we can really move effectively into alignment. And so we can use VIA also as a way of thinking about the chronological order, the time-based process for how we work with VUCA and how, whilst it is about being in each moment and that presence that many of you wrote about, it's, it also has a logic that takes us through time and that by coming into the center and finding our vocation and then really integrating our VUCA dimensions, we can then move very effectively in alignment with others. And by we, of course, I mean ourselves as coaches and in that parallel process, the way that we then support our clients to do that as individuals, as teams, groups, and organizations. I'd like to invite you now to take a moment to reflect on everything that we've been talking about and to think for a moment about how you might apply this, how you might identify and engage with your own VUCA qualities, what this means for the way that you engage with your clients, and if indeed there's a personal practice that you feel would be important coming out of this. There have been many references to mindfulness, for example, and that would enrich your coaching. And I'll be quiet for a moment here and invite just a couple of comments to come in, please, from Carl. Yes, please do so. Hello. Ah, yes. Understanding and consideration for our client's experience. <laughs> two people in VUCA means two people in co-construction. Nice. Um, Cause me to relate more significantly with myself and with my clients. I need to ground and center myself before each session, not to bring my full VUCA world, VUCA will wild into the session. Yes. Um, I love the metaphor of edge you shared. VUCA is all about the edge. Precar precarious and exciting. Time for me, time for coaching. Me time includes reflection and awareness. It was beneficial to focus on the opposites and remember they are strengths. Embrace the shadow self for you and your clients. We need to manage our VUCA. We can do our best thing. Expect the unexpected, yes. Become, oh wow, become vulnerable with them. Uh -huh. uh, yes, appreciation, curious and client focus, supporting the client's sphere and how it impacts other. VUCA seems to be always present. What is different is our awareness about its presence. That's a nice one. VUCA seems to be always present. What is different is our awareness about its presence. Relate to VUCA, easily seeing, meditation, stay centered, create opportunities, acknowledgements, 
remember affected Dan dancing dancing in now yes thanks have to leave yes <laughs> uh -huh. okay okay and um, what I what I what I read is the clear pattern that um, uh, our, our friends um, have become much more aware uh, about uh, the Zuka context in which they are coaching and that um, the awareness uh, on the VUCA context uh, should be part uh, or can be part of, 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 of the co-creation, the co-creative exercise that coaching always is, um, that, that, that VUCA itself uh, is essentially part of, of the common vulnerability the common humanity and, and the process of, of co-creation. So I think that what I want to say is not that we should try to find a solution for VUCA, uh, we should try to guide Kochi out of his VUCA world, but that we should try to integrate VUCA into the co-creative process itself. That is what I interpret uh, from all the inputs. Thank you, Carl, and thank you all for your inputs there. Um, indeed, we've gleaned and gathered some important learnings, I think, from today's uh, time together that's shortly going to be coming to an end. I would like to particularly highlight uh, those of you who shared specific practices, uh, meditation, time for self, grounding self. Uh, for me, one of my practices is dance, and in fact, the photographs that you've seen were, including this one here, were me actually drawing on a wooden floor with water uh, and uh, dancing in such a way that I created images that would be there and then that would pass away as they evaporated, which is a, a kind of metaphor, I guess, for the learnings and for our very presence here in life. I think also what comes through really strongly is this idea of our shared vulnerability. And I think it comes back to this idea that life and our life work are not problems to be solved, but rather mysteries to be lived. And I'd really like to encourage you to continue the dialogue that we've been sharing here today with yourselves, with others around you. I've been very touched by the wisdom and the depth with which people have engaged. And I would like to encourage you to come and visit. We've, it's got quite a simple website, but there are some relevant articles there that you might find of interest. We don't generally advertise many of our programs for coaches. We do have an accredited uh, training program, but also there are masterclasses and other things. So if you're interested in staying in some kind of contact, please do write to us by email. And it really only remains for me to say thank you all very much indeed. Uh, I've loved our time here together. I think it's been for me, as I hope our work always is as coaches, a time of personal reflection and learning and exploring. And I would like to thank you, Carl, and all your colleagues for your generous hosting and for your support in reading and summarizing people's input. So this is going to be goodbye for now from me. Thanks again. And I encourage you to keep uh, dancing in that still center of your own VUCA and exploring what it means for you and how our VUCA nature that we share, each one of us, with every other human being can be a way in to really deepen our own coaching practice. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for your great, absolutely fabulous uh, contribution. I think that all of us have deeply, deeply enjoyed it. Thank you so much again. Uh, for those needing it, the second password is time. Time. That's the second password. And so both of them you have to send. Uh, you can send them to me uh, or you can send them to icfteamcoaching at gmail.com as in the presentation mentioned you can download because Elizabeth Jackson is no longer working for ICF. I'm sorry, so don't send it to her. Send it to me or to icfteamcoaching at gmail.com. Thanks a lot, everybody, for the great participation and for the huge, 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 very valuable interaction. Thanks a lot. Bye. See you next time.